Okay, can everyone hear me? Okay, so uh, this session, uh, Get Over the Hurdles, Upgrade and Migration to Project Server 2013. My assumption here is many of you are running Project Server 2010 and you want to figure out how to go to 2013 or you're running an older, older version of Project Server. My name is Nadine Morelli. Um, I'm a, a new PM on Microsoft Project on the Microsoft Project team. So I've only been on, at Microsoft for about seven months now. Um, I was doing a, so I was a software consultant and developer uh, working in the armored car industry and in uh, pharmaceuticals. So just to give you a bit about my background. Um, on the team, I'm, I work on primarily on project online, uh, security, and now deployment and upgrade. So this session, we're going to cover um, how to migrate to Project Server 2013. We're going to go uh, over high level what the PowerShell scripts you have to call to get the job done. Um, we're not going to go that far in depth to me actually executing them for you because the actual upgrade process takes, even on an empty database, it could take half an hour to an hour if you take an empty project site with a content database and move it all over. So I'm not going to have time to go through that level. Um, there's two other sessions that um, I think have already done, and you can watch the video for them. The first one is Project Server 2013 Deployment Best Practices for the Field. Here you'll be able to learn all the information we've collected with how different uh, customers have actually gone ahead and implemented and what they've learned and kind of get a whole body of knowledge for you guys to take advantage of. Uh, another session, which will actually go more in depth into the PowerShell area, is the Great Database Consolidation Project Server 2010 to 2013 Migration in Eight Easy Steps. And that session was yesterday as well, so you'll be able to at least download the video and slide deck for that when they become available. Um, so there will be some overlap in my session between these two sessions as well. So what we're going to cover today, first we're going to talk about the uh, compatibility, what version of what will work with what. Um, then we're going to talk about Project Online and versus Project Server. We're going to briefly talk about what you can move towards from 2010 or older um, and the different sort of uh, structures people have versus on-prem versus a, uh, uh, infrastructure as a service versus going to an online service like Project Online. We'll talk briefly on how to migrate to Project Online and then we'll go into spending a lot more time on migrating to Project Server 2013 which is what you guys are all here for. So Project Server 2013. Uh, Project Server 2013 has been built upon uh, SharePoint Server uh, 2013 Enterprise, which means that you will require SharePoint Server 2013 Enterprise to install Project Server 2013. You can install Project Server on the same box, the same farm as uh, SharePoint Server 2013 Enterprise, uh, but you cannot install Project Server 2013 on SharePoint Foundation 2010. So I'm going to repeat that one more time. Project Server 2013 requires SharePoint Server 2013 Enterprise. You can install it on the same farm, but you cannot uh, run Project Server 2013 on SharePoint Foundation Server 2010. The previous iteration had almost the exact same requirements. Project Server 2010 required SharePoint Server 2010 Enterprise. You could install it on the same farm, but it would not work with uh, the previous version of SharePoint being off uh, SharePoint Server 2007. So when it comes to the client, uh, so internally, half the time we call project professional. It's too long for us to say it. We refer to it as either project client or WinProj, which is the name of the executable. So I apologize if I switch the terms. Um, it's, not, it's just a habit. So project professional 2013, and we have project pro for Office 365. These two versions provide the same functionality right now. Uh, Project, Project Pro for Office 365 is our subscription-based service. It essentially is run, uses the click-to-run technology. You get, it's a per-user license, which means you get five installs on five different machines. Um, and essentially, you're always running the latest and greatest bits. Um, so and every time there's a hot fix or a patch or whatever it is, this version will automatically update where Project Professional 2013, you have to run the patch or upgrade or whatever it is, or service pack yourself. So it's kind of a trade-off between do you want to have to worry about any of this stuff or do you want to control when updates and all that fun stuff can happen. It also means that whenever the next iteration of project uh, client comes out, if you're running this subscription-based, you automatically get, get that, whereas you would have to wait and purchase the next version of Project Professional 20N or whatever the hell the number will be. So 
Project Professional 2013 and Office Pro, uh, Project Pro for Office 365 will only connect to Project Server 2013 and Project Online. You cannot use them to connect to older versions of Project, uh, so 2010 or 2007, and that's basically the limitation. They can only connect to the current version of Project Server 2013 and Project Online. Project Professional 2010 has a similar type of requirement. It can only connect to Project Server 2010. It can't connect to online. It won't be able to connect to 2013. And Project Professional 2007 is kind of the only exception to the rule. It can connect to its counterpart, Project Server 2007. And it can connect to Project Server 2010 if you went through an upgrade from 2007 to 20, uh, 2010 on the server side and turned on backwards compatibility mode. So the main point of this slide is that the newest clients can only run on the newest version of the server and online. And you can mix and match. So you can take your project professional client application, point it to the online service, or point it to the, an on-prem version. Same with the Office 365 version. You can point it online or point it on-prem. So just going a bit more in depth on the different ways people run project. So there's basically three ways people run project. The first is running it on uh, on-prem, which basically gives you full control over your whole stack, um, but with all that control, you have a lot of responsibility in mind. It's your job to figure out what the networking is, what the storage is, what kind of hardware you want to run on, virtualization, which is common now, what operating system you wish to use, patching, um, what runtime, what version of all, basically all the services you want, plus you can actually run as many services as you want on this box. The downside is that now you have to deal with things like patching, uh, antivirus scanning, uh, Hardware failure is probably the main one. So if some hardware piece of hardware goes down, you're responsible to get someone to fix it. You're responsible for where your data, uh, your, your data backups go. There are pros and cons to running it on-prem. You get excellent latency because it's right, hopefully, hopefully it's not sitting underneath someone's desk, but you have like a data center nearby. You'll get, that, you'll get excellent latency because it's nearby. You'll get access to your data. You can actually do all the types of customizations you want because it's your server. You can do whatever you want with it. Um, and there may be some other requirements, legal reasons why you decide to keep it in-house or maybe you just don't trust anyone else having access to it. The next sort of option people use is infrastructure at a as a service. These include things like Azure or even Amazon Web Services where you basically say, I don't want to deal with any of this hardware problem. I'll let that be someone else's problem. I know how to install patches. I know how to install virus scanners. I know how to back up my data. I know how to run my service. So you'll take the, the middle option where you're basically outsourced that, that whole area. Um, the downside to this is, once again, you're still having to handle uh, backups, uh, patching. Uh, you can still do all the customizations you want, but there's still, there's still sort of a management side that you need to take care of to keep things up to date, to manage your own downtime. The final option, which is what Office, uh, Office 365 and Project Online handle, is where basically you're just paying for the service you need. You don't care about any of the other stuff. It's, I, look at, I look at this as an example of like a email. I expect to get email delivered. I expect that when I send an email, that email to get sent. Do I care what the server is doing all the rest of the time? I couldn't care less. As long as the, I'm paying for that functionality and I get that functionality, that's where the software as a service comes in. So if you look at this graph here, you'll see that uh, on the on the lower axis, we have control, and then on the y-axis, we have a, uh, cost efficiency. So when you look at an on-premise solution, it's actually, as I said before, you get the most control. You can choose how everything will run. You can install as much stuff or as little stuff as you want on that server or servers or that farm. Um, you can throw in all the customizations you want. You get to control how av uh, highly available your services are. You can say, I want a clustered SQL server. I want multiple middle layers, multiple front ends. You get to control the scaling. Um, you also have to control what your DR farm will be, like how, if you're going to choose to have one. You get to sort of control all of that. Um, the problem is that whenever you host your own stuff, you have a capacity you aim for, say, 5,000 users. Your hardware may be able to, uh, may be able to handle 10,000 users. So you have this whole excess capacity that you're paying for with support that you don't need. You're paying for all this extra stuff, and that's where the, so the cost efficiency is lost. Also, when you look, think of a typical server, a typical workday, most of us hopefully only have to work nine to five, but that means a good almost two thirds of the time that server is sitting there doing very, very little. And you're, so you're paying for all that. If we look at the uh, infrastructure as a service, 
you, it's kind of a natural migration path for people to move to. So basically, they don't have to run their own IT, uh, like, uh, IT staff, or at least a smaller IT staff, because they have to handle the software level. But basically, everything's out there on the cloud. Someone else is taking care of making sure that the services are used, the hardware is used as efficiently as possible, and those costs are being handed down to you. And this is usually the migration path people take, because really, they don't care that much about the hardware. They only care about the customizations or third-party apps or, part, like, or partner tools to be able to run on that. And that's what they're most interested in. You're still required to worry about your own high availability. How many of these services are you going to run together to get you the performance and capacity you need? And then what happens in a, in a, a disaster uh, scenario? Then we have the final option, which is sort of the Office 65 project online. So in this case, you're paying just for the service. You couldn't care less what's going on in the background. You don't care if, if, there's a de if something goes on on the main farm and you're being rem remoted to like a disaster recovery farm. You don't care about any of that. You just expect the service to work. In this scenario, everything's handled for you. It's, uh, you get upgrades. You should get almost no, like, zero downtime when an upgrade happens. You should just say, next time you log in, you see, oh, there's a new feature here. You can start using it right away. You don't care. You also don't have to worry about high availability or scale. So like, if you have 1,000 users right now, if tomorrow you, have, you, you merge with another company, for example, you have another 1,000 users, well, then you have 2,000 accounts. You don't have to worry about actually planning capacity or anything like that. All that's kind of taken care of for you. And so because we have to host hundreds of thousands of tenants and I don't know, millions of users, we've taken care of all that for you, and we can do it as cost-effectively as possible. So uh, uh, this has been, uh, slides come up a couple times in, in uh, different uh, presentations. Um, we have the top level there is the different ways to access the service. We have our three tiers. The stuff outlined in blue is what's available on Project Online only. The stuff in purple is stuff that you can use uh, on project server that you have access to either through SDKs or directly. Um, some of the high level changes that have happened uh, are our queuing system has changed as opposed to one queue per PWA instance. We have one queue per farm. And some of these changes have to do with the fact that we're actually running the same version that was installed on prem with what we're using online. So, a number of the changes we had to make was because we can't have, if there's a thousand instances in a farm, we can't have a thousand queues running. We have one queue running servicing all 1,000 instances. Um, the eventing service also has changed online. Uh, basically, we don't allow you to install third-party DL, like any DLLs on our service. So, but we gave you the ability to do a remote procedure, a remote call to another web service. So, if you, whenever an event happens, you can configure it to call a web service. If you're using on-prem and you upgrade, you're going to have to turn on our, an operational policy such that you can still run any DLLs you install locally. And we can cover more about that later. So. How to get to Project Online if that's the way you choose to go. There's three kind of methods to get there. The first one is using Project Professional. You basically take your MPP file from your previous version of Project, uh, project Client, and you basically can load it up uh, into there and just point it at your online instance. So the data inside the MPP file is what's actually going to end up going to Project Online. So we'll create the project, it'll create the tasks, it'll do, take care of the task assignments. But that's about all it will do because all the there's a lot more information that's stored on your project server that's not available in the MPP file. Timesheets, admin settings, portfolios, all that information will not migrate up with it. The second option is using one of our partner uh, options. So uh, uh, Fluent Pro's Cloud Migration Pro tool, essentially will, you can point it at a Project 2010 or even Project 2013 instance, point it to your online site, and essentially it'll take care of bringing in almost all of the data from your Project 2010 instance onto Project Online. There's a, rep there's a booth downstairs, and we have a representative here as well who can answer any questions you guys have, more, uh, if you have any more specific details of what may or may not be migrated. But uh, most of, if not all of it, will be migrated. The other option is to use Project Online going forward. And that means that stop creating new projects in Project Server, just make all your new projects on Project Online, and just close off those projects as, as you complete them. The downside to this last option is that you can't figure out your resource availability because the, the two services won't talk to each other either. So if you have Bob assigned to a task next week on-prem, and you, you could also, someone could also sit there and assign him a task online next week as well. So you're going to have those type of resource issues. The other issue you'll have to figure out is if you do the types of reports you need to run, you'll have to use either O data with, sorry, you'll have to use O data with SSIS to bring the data down and do reports that will talk to your on-prem instance and your online instance at least until you finish the, the couple months or six months migration period to get all new projects to work on Project Online. So migrating to Project 2013. So there is no in-place upgrade. From 2007 to 2010, there was an option for a database-attached upgrade, and there was 
an option for an in-place upgrade. That is turning out to be extremely complex, so we only allow an attached database upgrade. Also, just similar to previous versions, is you cannot upgrade from older than 2010 instances to 2013 directly. What that means is that you're going to have to get your, your, your instances from 2003 to 2007, and then from 2007 to 2010, and then finally from 2010 to the upgrade path we have set up that way. There is a uh, virtual migration environment that allows you to at least ease at least one of the steps from 2003 to 2007, and in the slide deck there will be a link to it so that you can grab that if you need it. Some other the infrastructure changes that happen. So in Project Server 2010 inside SharePoint, you have your site collection, which you could have a bunch of stuff related to a project, that upcoming project, um, a bunch of collateral. So all this exists in your current site collection. So when you wanted to set up Project Server on it, you would install Project Services. You would, when you created a PWA instance in the background, we would sit there and create a new site collection, and you would get your PWA instance uh, hosted at the root of the site collection. And what the, the downside to this unfortunately, is that if you have one site collection that has all the whole bunch of data into it, in it now, and now you have a separate site collection which has your PWA site in it. And so it becomes an issue that you don't have to tell your, your users, okay, well, here's where, here's where you can go for all your collateral, all your stuff, all your tasks that you have already in SharePoint, and now you have to go to this link to get for your PWA site. You, even though you can add SP webs to this site collection below, you either have to take care of migrating it or you have users sort of switching back and forth. It's not the most nice transition that we had. So, in 2013, when you have your 2013 SharePoint farm, you, uh, you set up project, serv uh, project services, and if you use PowerShell, you can sit there and add a PWA instance to an existing site collection hanging off the root or anywhere you need it to be in the site collection. Also, and so this give us, gives you the ability that all your customers or users are all going to one location to get all the data, all the collateral is in one place, and it makes the transition or to get to use PWA much easier for them. Also, if you still want, using the central admin, you can still put a PWA uh, site at the root inside of its own site collection. So we haven't taken that ability away. But I want to point out that you need PowerShell to actually hang it off if you want, don't want to make it at the root. So the database attach upgrade. So in Project Server 2010, you had your content database and four project, specific, uh, project databases. So during the migration, at a high level, you're basically going to, yeah. So just, on a, just you're going to have to really, really speak up okay. or talk on the mic because this thing has a really loud fan. <laughs> right. Yes, using, using PowerShell, you can actually hang it off of a, an existing site collection in a, in a path. Uh, there's another session going on right now. I don't remember the name of it. Uh, Alex, our dev lead, is actually running it, and he's going to be talking about how to do those type of things. In other words, PWA does not need to be at the root of the site collection. Exactly, yes. Okay. So the process for migrating the databases is you back up and restore your content database. We're going to, do, we're going to talk about all the work that needs to be done there and all the upgrading required. Then we're going to take all four of your project databases. You're going to restore them on the target, on the new SQL Server, and basically you're going to run a tool which is basically going to compress, compress might be the wrong word, put them all together into one database. And the way we did this is that we just made four new schemas. So what was initially in the draft database was now in the draft schema. What was initially in the published database goes into a pub schema. What was originally in the reporting is still called DBO, and what was in the archive database is now called ver. So the reason why reporting was still called DBO is because you had access to run all your reports and procedures, anything you want to do in 2010. And if you never specified the schema, then by default, your queries always assume DBO. So by leaving the schema as DBO, we give you the ability to hopefully, if you have to make changes, the changes are uh, very, very minimal. So that's the main reason why, because that question has come up a couple times, why we've kept the schema called DBO for reporting. You're also highly encouraged to switch to OData because that's what we use online going forward. So. Another caveat to this migration is that you are required to, you're moving the content database over, which means that when you move the content database over onto the, the new SharePoint farm, you have to move all the site collections with it. So if I have two PWA site collections existing in my, con my content database, I in the end have to move all this over in one migration window. The reason is, is if you don't, 
you can actually say I want to move just service right now. And then later on, if I want to move the consulting PWA site over, well, you don't know if the users have added data to the content database. You can't re-migrate this content database because the content database already exists on the new farm. And you can't say, oh, and if you do decide to migrate that content database, any new data that was added to that content database is now lost. So the one caveat here is that you have to migrate. In this case, if I have two PWA sites, I'm migrating nine databases all over in one shot. So now our migration plan. We're going to go through each one of these, this flow chart. The first thing to do is plan. And this is the one thing that we hear that most people don't necessarily do or do that well. So, or actually, we hear most of the time people just skip it. So the idea is this, we have to figure out what, and this is like a generic, a generic flow chart for, for a lot of situations. So the first thing you need to understand is what are the new capabilities of 2013 that you want to take advantage of that can replace the current processes in 2010. Um, and you have to figure out how long is it going to take for this whole process to happen because there will be, unfortunately, be downtime. And so do you have to plan this over a weekend? Is this something you can do actually one evening? So you have to sit there and plan and be able to mitigate all that downtime. You prepare what's going to happen. How are we going to get there? Which process do we have to follow? Are we doing the whole, are we running 2003 and we have all these interim steps to get all the way there? Is it something straight and, like straight and straightforward? Um, and then we're going to set up build test farms. The one thing we're going to do over and over and over again is you're going to build up a SharePoint 2013 farm. You can take a backup of your databases without affecting anyone, and you're going to migrate that farm. And then you're going to figure out what worked, what didn't work, and then you're going to tear that farm down. You're going to document what worked, what didn't work, and you're going to do it again. And you're going to do it again and again and again until you have it down to like an art. You're going to have everything scripted so the downtime window will be as small as possible. And at the very end, once, you built, once you've done your, migration, your test migration, you're going to test the hell out of it because you don't want to find out later on when you do your final migration that you missed something. Because once the final migration is done and the users are using the new system, backing them on to a 20, pointing them back to the 2010 farm will be a data loss issue and they're not going to be very happy. Uh, there's the, I mentioned earlier there's a deployment best practices from the field session, which you can also take a look at. Okay, so setting up your new farm. So since at this point you have to set up a new farm, you might as well take into account the different types of capacity planning that you want, that you have to, to plan for. So there, as you look here, we have availability and performance. So uh, you have a small farm, which is usually our three-tiered architecture. So you can use this for a development environment or a proof of concept environment. Or maybe project server isn't that heavily used, and you don't need a large farm to run it. So in this case, this farm here being very, very small is actually the minimum you're supposed to be able to run everything in using three boxes. There's nothing that stops you from running the entire, entire farm in one box. We don't, necessarily, we don't uh, necessarily support that scenario, maybe more for development stuff, but it's not, it's not recommended at all for a production environment. And there, for a number of reasons, a small farm for a production environment is not necessarily suitable. Any one of those boxes go down for whatever reason, someone trips over the power cable or someone does an upgrade goes, goes wrong, your entire farm is down. You have, if any one of those points are not running, then, then Project Server and SharePoint, if you're using that together, are not running. You also have the least amount of, yeah? There's, there's, a, there's a whole technical article de deciding, like, that de de will help you decide the, the type of how many boxes at each level you should have and how big of a farm you should be. The problem, yeah, go on. It's not that straightforward. It depends, it's, it's unfortunately, it depend, you could have very, very few tasks, but if you're baselining all the time, like, there's, it's a whole, it depends on the functionality you need. So we, I can't give you, like, the, the gold standard. If you attend the architecture, architecture getting your hands dirty session that was yesterday, so you have to watch the video for it, they, he, uh, Chris Boyd talked a bit about this, and there's a common ratio that we even use online where it's, I believe it's uh, two front ends, one app, one database tier, I believe is what, it's all in his presentation. But that's sort of the convention. That's actually roughly what we're aiming for even on the online servers. Yes? Yes. Yes, so um, as I said, so, Actually, the one thing I didn't mention on the architecture diagram is we have a PCS service now. So it's the project calculation service. So basically what we do is uh, in, in 2010, there was a scheduling engine that existed on the server, and there was a scheduling engine that existed in, in project, uh, project Professional. So what we did is we said, well, we're having two different code bases. It's hard to keep them because they're written in different technologies. It was hard to keep them up to date. And we have a, a scheduling engine that we've been using for 
whatever, two decades now. So we said, we made that, that scheduling mesh and replaced the one on the server with that one. So every time someone does something that requires scheduling, we spin up these new, these new PCS uh, instances, which is basically, if you think of uh, Project Professional, we ripped out everything out of it except for what was needed for scheduling. And every time you do something that requires a, re a recalculation of your schedule, we spin up one of these instances, we do all the rescheduling and saves. So that happens on the background. Plus our queue, which I said before, if you have several instances, we have one bigger queue that's supposed to handle all the instances. Project 2013, there's one queue per one queue now. Sorry, I guess I wasn't clear on that. So if you have, in, in 2010, if you had three PWA instances, you had three queues set up. Now there is one queue for the entire farm. And that was only because your Project 2013 and Project Online at the time of shipping were actually were the exact same version. Obviously, the online version, we have fixes and stuff. But as of when they both shipped, they both ran the exact same version, which means the queue would be the exact same architecture. Yeah, so there are uh, more, memory, more, memory, bleh, sorry, more memory requirements on, uh, on the farm. So the queue currently, the queue is now designed to have four concurrent threads. Um, and so they can handle four jobs. It, you can actually change the number of threads that are being used to process. But then you will, you could still run into issues where if there was a, something happening in the queue that blocked. On, on, in 2010, if something on the queue was blocking a job, technically speaking, if enough of those things happened, that queue would stop be able to process that instance. And you would have to go diagnose that. Same thing can happen now. It's actually technically a little bit more exposed. Because now if you have, the default is four jobs. If you have four different instances or four different things will block the queue, eventually your queue will stop processing all the instances. So that, that management monitoring still needs to be there. There's been some performance increases. And what you can do is you can also increase the number of worker processes the queue has. So if you have I don't know, two instances, then you can increase it up to 10. And if there's ever a problem, hopefully at least something will keep going and you can go back and look at that one. So. Uh, you can actually, I don't want to spend that much time on this. Okay, so medium and large farms, the bigger, the, the, more, the, the larger the size of the farm, the more uh, availability you'll have, the more performance you'll get. Uh, you could be able to scale better. And then also, if you have to take servers offline for certain types, like to rotate them out, then you can actually do fixes and patches on them without actually bringing down, uh, bringing down the whole farm. The one caveat to that is that the, the project calculation service will, uh, doesn't handle taking, shutting off a server right now. So you can't necessarily just pull a plug on a server or take a server out of rotation. There's going to be some additional work in order to make sure that we're not calculating anything or that user, who's, that calculation service will need to be restarted and that user will need to resubmit their scheduling job. So as I mentioned, you, you'll, you should also have multiple environments. You should have a development environment, proof of concept, test, especially a test and staging one because anytime you guys are applying a hot fix or, making, or adding in a third party customer's app, you want to make sure that it's going to work properly in a testing and staging environment before you sit there and run it on your production environment because at that point, at least in your testing and staging environment, you can sit there and figure out if something, something's going to go wrong, hopefully, before it actually does go wrong in production. So the minimum requirements, I don't, I don't go into detail about the hardware requirements, so you'd have, there's a, a link in the technic article that can get you that. So here are the minimum requirements for Project Server 2013. And as I, as I said the word minimum, it's by no means what I would recommend, personally. Windows Server 2008 R2 Service Pack 1 is the minimum requirements to run Project Server and SharePoint. By no means should you necessarily run the minimum requirement. It makes perfect sense to me to run Windows Server 2012 um, and use the latest. Like There's been several years more of development, several years of improvement, several years of performance. You might as well run the latest version. The one caveat, and I ran into this problem when I was getting ready for to, to, to research this stuff for the last couple of months, is that SharePoint cannot be installed on Windows Server 2012 R2. I don't know if you guys have tried that. It does not work. We are waiting for Service Pack 1 of SharePoint to come out. So once Service Pack 1 is available, you'll be able to install SharePoint with Service Pack 1 on a Windows Server 2012 R2. So just like I ran this into about two months ago, and I spent time looking on the forums, and then I realized this problem. So. SQL Server 2008 R2 Service Pack 1 is the minimum. No reason why you can't run SQL Server 2012 R2. We support all, all the major browsers because all our PWA sites are HTML5 compliant. Uh, you, you, if you want to use the client, Project Professional client, you need Windows 7 or Windows 8. 
As I mentioned before, SharePoint Server 2013 is, is a hard requirement for Project Server. Uh, Exchange Server 2013 is an optional uh, service you can, you can run with it. The benefit of Exchange Server 2013 is the task synchronization that we now have. So if you decide to use this feature and, and, and hook it into Project Server, tasks in Project Server will actually get synchronized into Exchange. And then once, once the tasks are in Exchange, you get access to the three different interfaces that Exchange provides, Outlook, OWA, and the Windows Phone. So in all three of those interfaces, your project tasks can show up, and then you can actually sit there and, and update the status in all of them. And that's what you get for free just by having Exchange uh, configured in, uh, with uh, Project Server. Uh, TechNet is not necessarily a requirement, but TechNet is a source of all truth. So whatever TechNet says beats out whatever I say, because that's what's been documented, and they'll be more up to date than whatever I'm giving you today. Yes. I believe so. There's a all work in one place, which I believe shows up on my site, which basically will take your tasks from the Exchange, uh, Project, SharePoint, and I'll put it in one place for you, yes. And then Link, uh, as you saw Heather demo during the keynote, while you're working on a project, if you want to ping someone and say, well, I think this is going to take three days, and the person your message is saying, are you crazy, it's going to take two weeks, at least you can help with collaboration that way. So we support Project, uh, sorry, Link 2010 as a way of, of communication, yes. Sorry, I, I can't, you, there's a fan here, you gotta speak up. Yes, I believe so. Sorry, say it again? For, uh, for SQL Server or for Windows? So the problem is with, Win, with Win, uh, SQL Server uh, 2012 R2, you can't do that right now until Service Pack 1 comes out. So, so it, it, that's up to you. You'd have to see what the new features are and if you want to take advantage of them, but obviously if it's a newer version, Usually there's more performance enhancements, more features that it makes sense to upgrade to. Yeah. And so there's a link here that'll describe all the hardware requirements. So when you're installing Project Server 2013, uh, when you wanna, you need to have Excel services running, that's used for reporting, so is Performant Point Service and the Secure Store Service, and then the State Service is used for charting. And obviously, you'll need the project service application when you have uh, installed and running to actually create the PWA instances and actually run project. Yeah. You mean PCS, a project calculation service? Oh, BCS. I, I, you can check TechNet. We can talk, we can talk with uh, someone I can point you to who wouldn't, who's our documentation person. He would know. I, I don't know if there's a matrix like that. Yeah. OK, so now, upgrading to Project Server 2010. So for anyone here who's running an older version, like 2003, 2007, as I mentioned before, there's no way to go directly to 2013. You have to use intermediate farms. And as I said before, it would also require more, more uh, downtime. So essentially, you're going to take your Project Server 2003 instance. You're going to set up an intermediate farm or use the virtual migration environment, upgrade to there, set up a temporary Project Server 2010 environment, upgrade to there, and then finally, you can do the steps to, to do this. So uh, that's why I was saying before, this will take significantly more time than just doing the last step, obviously. So you need to plan this, and you might have to uh, figure out how long this will take. And obviously, when you use, once you take a backup of your project server databases in 2003, you can then do this and figure it out as many times as you need to to try to figure out ways to mitigate the amount of time it takes. And you can also use virtual machines. There's no point setting up wasting a whole bunch of hardware and stuff. The only benefit would be is that it would take less time. So now that we're... We're getting ready. We actually are now on Project Server 2010. There's a couple things that need to be done to get ready. First of all, a feature that's not available in Project Server 2013 
is the act, prevent active directory synchronization. So if you have any users that have this feature turned on, you're going to have to turn it off. If you don't, these users will disappear in Project Server 2013 when the synchronization begins. So there's a, a SQL statement there that will tell you the list of resources that currently have this feature enabled, and you need to go and disable these, these, uh, this feature for these users. Also, you should be running database and uh, consistency checks. And just to quickly go over what will be migrated, almost all the data that Project Server has access to and uses will be migrated over. So that's project, tasks, task assignments, project sites, project site documents, timesheets. Since you're migrating, you're also going to move over the content database, all the collateral in there should all be migrated. But what will not be migrated? So if you're using, if you've created extra columns, extra tables in your, in your reporting database, we don't know what those are, so we can't migrate them. So you're going to have to come up as part of your migration plan to see, okay, well, I've added these extra columns here, these calculated fields, these extra tables, and you're going to have to recreate those reporting changes into the project server database. Also, if you use customized things, uh, customized things like customized web parts, you'll need to test those as they move over. If you've used, uh, created custom DLLs for workflow and activities, you need to decide, am I going to reinstall those? Those should work on Project Server 2013, you need to decide, am I going to reinstall those, or am I going to take a uh, look at SharePoint's uh, uh, workflow designer tool that's available now? And if you're using any third-party vendor tools, you need to talk to them to find out, will their current tool work on 2013, or will, do they have a new version? Okay, the other feature, sorry, the other change that needs to be made is if you've upgraded from 2007 to 2010 and you're running in backwards compatibility mode. Unfortunately, backwards compatibility mode is not supported as part of an upgrade. So you will need to either turn that off, and the only feature that uses this is that it will, you know your 2007 project clients can't connect anymore. So one option is to turn it off, not that I recommend that. Another option is, is to build an intermediate farm, restore all your project data and your content databases there, turn it off, and then continue onward. Therefore, you're never ever affecting or modifying your production environment. So the middle farm here will not have BCM turned on. It will be running in native mode. So now we're getting into what needs to be done. So in SharePoint, there's a site collection lock you can turn on. This is what you can use during your final migration when you're happy and everything works. This will basically put a lock on the site collection, which will prevent users from changing site collection and uh, collateral on the project sites. Unfortunately, there is no direct way to put PWA into a read-only mode. So one suggestion is to put a read-only lock on the databases, which means that you should have already informed your users that there's gonna, something is going on, and putting a read-only lock on the users means they might be able to do some work, but they won't be able to obviously make any changes. This is, you can kind of prevent them from trying to do something, and then they're saying, well, my changes are gone. So um, you would have to try this out. I, this is just a suggestion I was talking about. I don't know if this is necessarily supported, but this is one option I would take personally. And basically, the users might get errors, but they're aware that they might be able to get to some of their data and see what's going on, but they can't make any changes. So you're going to back up the content databases. And as I said before, you have to back up and restore all the project databases for any sites that exist inside that content database. When you restore, uh, there is one query that you have to run to clean up some data, and that is to set the, the account to, uh, to null, where it's currently blank, because this will affect the database upgrade. So now that we're actually, all our databases are now set up on the new farm, we're going to mount them. So the first step is you create on a web application on SharePoint. I'm not going to go too much in depth on the SharePoint side. You create uh, the web application, whatever you want to call it. So in this case, I would be creating one called contoso.com. I would set up all the, ap uh, all the application pools, and it would force me to create a content database, a temporary one. I'm not, I think there, there could be issues where there could have been some sort of corruption or something, and this is just to clean it all up. It, it, my assumption here is that it should have been set to null, and I don't know why it would not be. So this is just us saying we're setting it all to null in this case. No, I don't know what might happen. You could, you could always try it out, see what happens, right? But you, you have test farms and stuff like that, so you... Well, 
for, for 2010, this shouldn't make any difference. But for the upgrade, this could cause a problem. You, when, obviously, you're doing the upgrade multiple times until you're, until you're satisfied that it works. So it may not cause you any problems. This is just a recommended step. Yes? You, if you created the, if, you, if so, so you're talking, sorry. So if you create, so creating separate sites means it's still inside the con same content database. So one option could have been is that you create separate content databases and just stick your PWA sites. In, so if, th if that was done, then if you look, if you think of it that way, you created a content database and, and there's only gonna be one PWA instance in there, then you're doing the minimum amount of work, which is just restoring the five database attached. But this scenario here, if you created more than one instance, then you have to migrate all nine databases. A, there could be call, multiple site collections can exist in a content database. So even though if you made 10 site collections, they can all exist in the same content database, which means when you migrate the content database, all 10 site collections have to go with it. Your other option could have been initially when you set it up was, I'm gonna make 10 content databases and then put up one site in each one. So then you can migrate over depending on how your content databases are, like your site collections and your content databases are set up. So you create your web application. Uh, you're then going to test your content database. This will tell you about anything that could help block SharePoint update, upgrade. It'll give you a warning uh, or blockers of what features you're missing. And it'll tell you if any site definitions are missing. So once you're, you've figured out or installed whatever you need to do to get around most of those problems, if not all, you then mount the, the database onto the farm, and this gives SharePoint access to the content database. Next, we're gonna update the site owners. So for all the sites in the content database, I'm focusing specifically on the PWA ones. We set up the, we reassign the ownership of the site collections. We're then gonna migrate users from the, win and this will force window, uh, users that were in Windows uh, cl uh, Classic Authentication Mode to switch to Claims Authentication, uh, Claims Based Authentication Mode. And then we're gonna sit there and test out all the sites in the site collection. Here I'm showing the PWA one, and then there's a way you can check the health and run health checks on the site. Now, in SharePoint, when you uh, wanna to migrate to SharePoint 2013, you can choose not to upgrade your sites. So sites can run in SharePoint 2010 mode, which basically you'll run the old, like the original look and feel to the users. When you upgrade it to 2013, you'll get the new cascading style sheets and the new look and feel. PWA, you must upgrade. We don't support running it in 2010 mode. So that's why the step here at the bottom is to upgrade the PWA sites. So that one upgrades the service PWA one in my example. So now comes the fun database conversion where we kind of squish everything together into one project database. So for every four databases you migrated over, uh, so you backed up and restored, you're gonna run this convert to PowerShell script, which will do, it'll take all four databases, it'll make a brand new one with the data inside each of the four schemas that I mentioned earlier. Now, this is a destructive operation. So what that means is, in order for us to do this migration, the four databases you restored, I wanna be clear, the ones you restored are now garbage. So you still have your original production environment databases running on the 2010 farm, you still have the backups, but these four databases that you restored can no longer be used, you might as well drop them. They cannot be reattached to a 2010 farm anymore because we had to make alterations during, the, during the, the conversion. So now we're gonna take our one project database, we're gonna mount it on the farm to give SharePoint access to it. We're then gonna run a whole slew of tests on it by running the test SP project database. This will tell us any errors that can cause it to fail. So this database is kind of like an in-between step. It's not really 2010 compliant because it's one database, and it's not 2013 because it doesn't have any 20, 2013 schema in it. So the upgrade SP project database will actually bring us up to the 23rd compliant schema. So this, this step in the conversion step, I was playing with it on a, inside of a virtual machine, takes a little bit of time. On an empty database, it took me about 20 minutes to 40 minutes to do the conversion and upgrade. So be prepared that this, obviously I was running this on a, on a, a VM on a very powerful machine, so just you have to take timing into your account. The final step, the final set of steps will be to mount and upgrade the, the web, uh, web instance. 
So basically, we're going to up, uh, mount the project web instance. This will give SharePoint access to it. We can then run any tests, which will tell us if any features, if the BI Center exists. Uh, it tells us any errors about unprocessed queue jobs. About, it'll look at the project workspaces. And once we sort out any of those issues, we can then go ahead and upgrade the, SP pro, uh, the project web instance to bring it, that web instance up to the SharePoint format. Sorry? So your permissions should go with it, yes. No. So because you've backed up and restored the databases, we, the permissions didn't go with it unless you've reset up all the permissions again. So the database permissions work differently. You can give users uh, permissions to specific schemas as well, so you can make sure they only have access to the DBO schema, which is for reporting. But those permissions have to be reset up. That's a good point. Because you got to remember, the, the, if we look at the four databases, we've copied the data out of it, and we've made a brand new database. So we don't look at any of the roles which were not uh, dictated by us. Yeah, so you can, we, we still support users accessing the DBO schema because that's the new reporting database, for lack of a better term. Yes. So. The last step is to enable the PWA feature. This is the easiest one. So at this point, you should be able to actually log in and access your PWA site. So if you haven't done any like, heavy customization or heavy web parts and stuff, you should be able to actually log in and see the PWA site running and permissions and stuff, all that should work. Another sort of caveat to upgrade is that in, by default, so there's two permission modes available in 2013. There's project permission mode and there's SharePoint permission mode. Because you've upgraded from 2010, we leave it in project permission mode. But by default, all new instances are going to be turned on into project SharePoint mode, which you can obviously change using a PowerShell script. Yes. Sorry, say that one more time. Yes. Yes. Active Directory, yeah, we resync up with Active Directory. Okay, so now, once we're done our migration, and we're doing the, sort of the, the last sort of, this could be a long process depending on how much customizations you have, you can now reinstall your workflow and activities, you can re-add re in any reporting database stuff you use, uh, columns, tables. Um, you need to go through all your customizations that you had and see that it, will 2013 do what you need or do you have to actually add in or reuse the customizations that you had in 2010? Uh, issues and risk links, these need to be regenerated, and this can be done by going to the central admin and doing a bulk update. And then you need to go through and republish all the projects so that the issues and risk links get regenerated. Now, the administrator shouldn't just go blindly and republish all the projects. The sh he should be working with the, the project manager because not all the projects should be published. Maybe the project manager has a bunch of projects which are still in like a, pub a draft state, so we don't want the administrator to go and publish all of them. So during the migration, you need, you need to talk with the project managers to say, is it okay if I republish these particular projects because I need to regenerate the links. Uh, one other item to set up, the we enterprise project types. So in 2010, the basic project type is what's now, is now called something else in, uh, in uh, Project Server 2013. It's called Enterprise Project. And there's a new to Enterprise Project type called SharePoint Task List, which is basically a lightweight uh, way of managing projects where someone can go create any type of list they want. And when people are assigned to it, uh, we don't support scheduling with SharePoint Task List unless you're using Project Professional but you can actually see that someone has a task assigned to them on a specific day, and you can actually see the, re the, the fact that that user is actually assigned to work inside of PWA. So that falls under the post-upgrade tasks. So I'm going to go through a couple minor things. To So just to give you, uh, all I've done is I've taken, I uh, created a 2013 instance, and I've restored the two example sort of PWA sites. So you'll see that we have 
the four consulting databases that would have come back when I restored them. And then we have the new PWA consulting database that I would have created uh, after I did the conversion. And you'll see there's a bunch of tables in DBO. You'll see the draft view, publish, and so on. So once I've done my migration, I should be getting rid of these four databases because nothing can be done with them. They're garbage. They've been pretty much, they've been altered so they can't be mounted anywhere. Same with my PWA service database. I have my four project databases for PWA service and that's it being converted down to one. So the end goal with, with doing this sort of migration is to come up with a PowerShell script that does all the work for you because you don't want to have someone continually doing clicking, 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 and making mistakes along the way. So the idea would be is that you would have someone put a lock on the project, put, make the project databases read-only, put the SharePoint site and uh, lock down the SharePoint site, restore the databases, and then basically run through a script like this. So I've covered most of this, but exactly, uh, so basically test the database, mount, uh, reassign ownership, migrate the users, test all the sites out, Upgrade the PWA sites. You can also upgrade the content, uh, the main site collection if you wish. Run the two convert to application, uh, convert to PowerShell scripts to bring all the data together. Mount the project databases, test them, upgrade them. Mount the project web instances, test them, upgrade them, and then enable the PWA feature. So once the script has finished running, you can then start working on your post migration tasks, which is to the bulk, the uh, issues and risks bulk, uh, bulk import refresh. Um, add the project, enterprise project types that didn't come as part of the upgrade and any other, add any customizations or any other reporting columns and tables that you need. So, uh, I can add it to the slide deck, I guess. I just, this is the one I was using when I was playing with my, playing with it, okay. So in this, this is a full-on full brand new instance of project, of uh, PWA, and this is the one I migrated over. So when I go new on the, the brand new PWA site, you'll see that it comes with the enterprise project and the SharePoint task list. When I do it on a, my upgraded site, it's missing. It's basically, it's, this one is, the, the project basic plan is actually called, now called the enterprise project plan, and it's, this sample proposal came from my 2010 instance, and it's missing the SharePoint task list. So to go and recreate the SharePoint task list and to rename it, we're gonna go to the PWA settings, enterprise project types, we're gonna make a new one. So this is all documented on TechNet that we're gonna call it SharePoint Task List. We're gonna give it a description, which I'm too lazy to type. We're gonna say create new projects as a SharePoint Task List by default. We're gonna add in project details and schedule. We're gonna say use this as a default enterprise project type during project creation. We're gonna type in the, the link to the image that will show up. That's all available on the TechNet article. I have linked to my presentation. And then we're gonna hit save. Uh, it's, the SharePoint test list is optional, uh, but it's kind of like a lightweight project that you can, people can basically, an, an example would be is that I'm a, I'm a tester, I have work to do, but I have some downtime, so I'll make a list of interesting things that I need to work on, like upgrading our test environment or something like that, which may not be an official work assigned to the project, but if, I use, if you use tasks to help manage that, when you say, am I available, that information will show up saying, I've actually, well, Nadine has already said he's gonna work on this tomorrow. You know what, that's not a high priority. Get him off of there, I need this done instead. But at least you'll know that I'm, I'm not sitting there idle. You'll know the types of things I'm working on are kind of side of projects which might be of interest. So the second step is to, this is supposed to be called enterprise project. 
So now that's sort of the two steps required to, as, one, as the post migration. And while that's saving, since it's not a big deal, if, to regenerate the issues and links, we go to manage service applications, project service application. Uh, bulk, sorry, uh, bulk update connected SharePoint sites. So I type in what the URL is. It should automatically generate an update. And this will go through and regenerate all the issues and risks links. You will still need to go through and manually publish the projects. There are some, I, I believe there's some apps on the SharePoint site which will allow you to uh, force uh, publish all your applicant projects, but you need to decide if that's what you want to do because obviously some projects shouldn't be published yet because they're not ready. Issues and risks. Yes. So now if I go to, so now I have my issues and risks links will now work. I hope. Yep, yeah, it came up. So once you have all that, the last step, test, 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 and even test some more. Because while you're doing this as, you, as you, uh, part of your uh, migration test, now is the time to figure out what, can and what will and will not work. And you don't want to find out, as I said before, that when you've said, OK, everyone, stop, doing what you, stop working on it. I'm going to migrate everything over. OK, here's a new site. And they start using it. They start putting data in there. It's not going to look very good if you have to turn around and say, you know what, we have to redo this migration because something's happened and there might be a lot of data loss. So after you're doing all your test migrations over and over again, we go back to the planning step, which is let's figure out what worked, what didn't work, what could we improve, how could we minimize downtime, can we run some of the PowerShell scripts in parallel, can we do multiple uh, converts, like there's any number of things you could do to hopefully narrow down your migration window to become as small as possible. Any questions? Sorry, say, say it again. So this kind of migrates what I'm going to worry for a long time and whatever it is, and that's what we can then do with the plan. So we do the, and then how you say the drop out the file locally and do the release locally and whatever process or? So yeah, if you have, if you're working on Project Server 20, a Project Professional 2010 and they work on it locally, you can use, you can save the MPP file. You'd have to load up Project Professional 2013 load up that MPP file, and then point that at the new server. So you still need to use both. You need to use Project Professional 2010 to create the project if you want. Yeah, you, the yeah. so then you have to use Project Professional 2013 to load up the MPP file so that they can point it to the 2013 yeah. server. Yeah. Yeah. Publish. Uh, they should, the res they should be able to publish the resources as well, yes. Because you would, in, in your new farm, you would set up your, sorry, I guess I might, might have glazed over that step. In your new farm, you would set up enterprise resource syncing, hopefully to an Active Directory, and hopefully you're not adding them in manually, but you could just hook it up to an Active Directory. So in your new farm, you would set up enterprise resource, uh, enterprise resource uh, synchronization and again. So the user should be on both systems then. Any other questions? We all get to go home early. So we, we can't restrict access because it's your SQL server, so you can actually turn on whatever you want, but we only support, we only support access to the reporting database. Right. But nothing stops you from doing whatever you want. Yeah, you should only, you should only be using the DMEO, DMEO schema in the project database. And so it's no different than using the draft database in the old thing. We don't support that, so that's, you're going to an unsupported scenario, yes. The one thing I did forget to mention, and I hope this was clear during the conversion when I said the old databases are throwaway, so you shouldn't be setting up a link server 
and saying, here are the databases, convert them over. Because that will hose your production environment. So you should be doing a proper backup from your 2010 farm and restoring onto your 2013 farm. Don't be using link servers, please. In the, in the backup, I, I don't know. I don't know what the state of the databases are after we do the conversion, but you still have the backup anyways, right? right. Yeah. So you can just restore them again and then you have it then, yeah. And a couple of the reasons why we did the conversion was for total cost of ownership because it's easier to backup and maintain one database as opposed to four of them. And then we have all the issues where you do a publish and the server crashes, well then how much data move from one database to another? Now it's all in one location. and. Depending on when your backup ran, is your database, like if you, you back up the first, the draft database and you back up the published database, there's, a, there's an issue where data could have changed and you've missed that. So this kind of makes that easier. Yeah. Yes. Uh, apparently you can, you can restrict people to certain schemas, yeah. And there's even, um, I, it's covered more in the architectural view, but inside the project server database now, there's actually a fifth schema called Diag. DIAG, which basically the point of that is that if you need to give someone access to diagnose something, and exactly what we use for Project Online. So essentially when you do a query for all the tasks, we'll see ta the task ID and we'll see the task name, but the task name is all PI. It looks like a bunch of garbage to us, but we can link that garbage to other, we can figure out what tasks are involved with one project, and basically all the data has been scrubbed, so we can't see any of it because the views are actually uh, doing all this calculation to give us sort of a hashed value back. So that way, if you need to get a consultant to come figure out or someone to come look at what's going on, they can actually kind of try to diagnose it without actually reading any of your PII data. So that's actually something that we don't normally talk about, but there's actually a fifth view, and that's actually what we use on Project Online. So when there's a problem with your database or an issue, we can only, we're only, like, I can access the database, I can only see the diag view. So even though I can see that you might have 10 projects, I don't even know the name of the projects, I don't know when they start, the end, or anything else. I can just tell you you have 10 projects. And that's, what, that's basically what we use for on-call engineering if, if there's something that's going on. So that's something you guys get as well in there. Garbage, yes. No. You cannot use them to migrate again. So if you, if you need to, if there was a hiccup and you want to migrate again, you should be restoring the four databases again and then having to run the conversion again. Like those databases, once, the migrate, once that convert to script has run, and finished running, or if there was an error, at that point you should be considering those those four garbage and restoring from your backup again. And in case I want to uh, maintain a parallel environment, uh, or environment I want, so I because, install yeah, but so if you have your 2010 environment, yeah. you're going to backup the databases and restore, yeah. run the conversion, and then throw those four databases out. So hopefully you have a new 2013 environment. If there's any problems, then you still have your production environment because you haven't changed anything, right? The only, only issue you have is once you've finished upgrading your 2013 farm, if you point users to here and they start using it, now the there's new data here that's not in the original farm, that's when you'll have a problem. But otherwise, you can do this as many times as you want. <laughs> yeah. That is a good question. I don't know. If you, if you st come talk to me afterwards, I can find I I didn't even think of that. I, so I've, like, I'm, I've only been a PM on Microsoft for six months, and I've only been working on this area for a couple of months now. So. That would be cool to see that, that it's, I'm assuming everything should be checked in, actually. But I, I can, if you stay back, I, can, I, can, I know someone I can ask to confirm that. It's a good question. There you go. I'll see if I can add that in before they upload it. That's a, I can't believe I missed that. Non-PWA sites, yes. So, so like in my example, I had Contoso, Service PWA, and Consulting PWA. You'd have to upgrade the two PWA ones. The Contoso one didn't have to be upgraded. The, the, the SharePoint, the non-PWA SharePoint site collections don't need to be. They can actually run in 2010 mode. Yeah. Yeah. 
No, because the entire site collection has to get upgraded. So if for you to publish it, there must be a PWA. That PWA must be part of that site collection, and that entire site collection needs to be upgraded. Yeah. But if there's no PWA in the site collection, then you can leave it in 2010 mode if you wish. And then SharePoint has a whole story with how you can have users try it out to see what it looks like. And uh, eventually, I think you might need to, up to up, have to upgrade to 2013 before you can move on to the next iteration, whenever that is. But so non-PWA sites, you can leave in 2010 mode. PWA sites, so PWA sites that have PWA site collections must be upgraded. Any other questions? If you guys have any server reporting questions, the guy to ask is right there. Oh, the next slide. There we go. Okay. Thank you.